Ooh, yeah, we'll, we'll really, get down to the we'll really, down to the really tough, tough ones, ones, aren't we? Wait till you do the rubber band one. No, I know. I've, I've got no chance for that. I might give that a go. There's a spanner down there. There is. I'm Why there's a spanner in a body, I don't know. Hi, I'm Andy Powell. I'm Chief Information Security Officer at AP Monomask. Hi, my name is Paul Chichester, and I am the Director of Operations at the UK's National Cyber Security Centre. The NCSC is responsible for helping to make the UK the safest place to live and work online. Given the picture behind me, it's funny. Where I was, I was waiting in the Royal Air Force's Y2K cell for the end of the world. Party like it's 1999. I didn't. So I feel that I definitely had the better uh, New Year's Eve. Like Andy, uh, at uh, the turn of the millennium, I was also responsible uh, in GCHQ for managing some of our response to that. But late on the 31st of December, I left work and spent the evening partying, uh, watching the Manic Street Preachers. I did have to go back to the office afterwards, but I definitely did party. So Chich and I, our paths first crossed in 20, crumps, 2012. Andy and I met uh, in our professional roles uh, when I was working at GCHQ and Andy was working at the Royal Air Force. And we've known each other ever since. Hey, Chich, good to see you again. It's been a long time. Yeah, it has, <laughs> yeah, fantastic. So today we're going to be playing Operational. Which yeah, takes me back a bit. I think it's been a few years since I played this. Yeah, my, well, my daughter's a doctor, actually, so she'd be laughing her head off if she thought we were doing this today. Oh, you've probably been getting some sneaky lessons then, haven't you? I think you might, you well, might I've sort got, of, got, you know, got that cheating. Right. Right, so, ah, right, so we have a question yeah. and about the changing cyber threat landscape. Yeah. And what trends are we seeing? The threat landscape is constantly changing, and I think it changes in slightly different ways. So we have our traditional threats, cyber threats, nation states, um, countries that you know we've talked about uh, at length over the years, Russia, China, Iran, North Korea, um, been doing cyber operations for many years, developing their capability. Um, beyond that, uh, very conscious of ransomware for organizations, <sighs> oh. uh, a huge threat. <laughs> Um, and I think probably the one that most businesses and organisations should be sort of thought about and prepared for mm. because it's an indiscriminate threat. Actually, ransomware now isn't very often the, the thing that those actors are doing. It's actually extortion. Right. And so increasingly now they're not even encrypting the no. systems. No. Um, they're just they're, taking, they're just taking, taking the, data. the data and then threatening to leak it online. Um, and you know, from from an extortion point of view, and, and even now, you know, we see organisations um, who, even though they could recover the data, oh. even if they have been ransomware, will still pay a ransom. Sadly, I mean, this is a really great question. How would you say we can, as government and industry, work together better to protect the critical infrastructure um, in, in in the UK and, and uh, globally, obviously, from a MERS point of view? We are many companies like ourselves are running critical infrastructure in countries. Yay! Yay. I'm, I'm worried now. Yeah. And we're starting to see that governments are clearly, and there's legislation coming in with, with the new legislation across Europe um, that's requiring critical infrastructure to be better protected. But the companies who are running this critical infrastructure, the relationship with governments, not just in the UK, but globally, is difficult because Many of the governments approach us and say, we need to see what you're doing. We need the detail of how you're operating. We need to see inside your network. And of course, that creates an immediate barrier of mistrust. And we tend to get in certain countries, and not the UK, I hasten to add, but in certain countries, certain governments come to us and say, we well, expect to go inside your network and inspect. Now, for commercial reasons, that's just not possible because they'll be able to see other customers' data. That you know, We'll be breaking a lot of our privacy and sensitivity rules. We, we can't do that. So what we're looking for is a, an arrangement where we can provide you with the evidence that yeah. meets your questions, that meets your needs. Knowledge sharing, partnerships like that, how, how vital is that for, for a company like yourself? I think it's critical because um, we operate in 120 countries and you can imagine we, we've got different legislation, different criteria in different countries and it's extremely complex landscape. And there's, there's a combination, obviously, in big countries that we work with in the US, in, in Europe, and um, you know, certain you know, with yourselves. That's really generally quite clear. Um, sometimes, you know, quite hard, but yeah. we're working on it. In other countries globally, it's less clear. And there's a little bit of 
pressure we can provide to the government to say, what do you actually want? Because they're very diff they're not in a great place to define some of the standards that, that should be in place. And, yeah. and we tend to, to, to struggle a bit there. So the, it's the complexity, particularly yeah. for countries operating, companies operating multinationally. How can international organizations, industry and governments identify weaknesses and support key suppliers in the global supply chain? Actually, part of my job is um, working very closely with NATO on sort of uh, thinking about what it means uh, for cyber to be a sort of domain of operation in the NATO context yeah. and the role that NATO plays and cyber plays in its operations. And actually, when you think about um, the alliance and yeah. all the countries involved in that, uh, and then all the critical infrastructure in that country and those countries, and then, then its supply chain, sure. what you're trying to do is, is set a, a, a standard or, or set a, a, a level that everybody sort of works towards. So you're trying to set common standards at that level. And I think that's where international organizations are really important. If it's the EU, if it's NATO in their context, if it's other organizations, um, you know, whether, you know, things like the International Maritime Organization should be setting sort of Indeed. Uh, standards in that. But oh, no. finding an organization that can set standards that everybody can follow and yeah. trying to create a level playing field. Sure. Um, and I think that, and then really sort of thinking about what that means for the supply chain. Mm. How can the international organizations and governments help those smaller organizations which are niche key elements in the supply chain? Is there something they can do or are you looking to bigger organizations like us because we've got a dependency on them? How does that yeah. work? I think, I mean, there's a number of parts to that uh, question, I think. And sort of, you know, the first thing I think you need to know is what your critical supply chain is. Oh, yeah. um, and, and, and actually, that's a, a really hard thing in and of itself. Um, <laughs> If you, oh no. if you think about That's actually, might be a for a hard one there. Yeah. <laughs> and so actually trying to build up a, a sense, a map of, you know, who are the critical suppliers? What are the ones that actually everybody relies upon or, you know, and, and try and sort of get a sense of where your biggest risk is. Yeah. So I think understanding that and mapping that is a, a really, I think actually is potentially a, a government or certainly a, a national challenge. And so we've certainly, we've certainly been doing a lot of work over the last few years of actually creating a knowledge map of our critical infrastructure and thinking about for, from a, a sort of high level and the interconnectedness. So not just what does one part of the critical infrastructure rely upon, but what's the sort of element all the way through that. It's great that the governments are looking at those niche suppliers that, that are quite critical and appreciate So trying to share that would be quite useful. I know there's a little degree of confidentiality about that, but I'll give you one great example, which is quite critical to the United Kingdom, is that Maersk prides itself on moving one third of the world's bananas. All right, and actually 50% of the world of bananas in the United Kingdom yeah. were moved by us. So one in two bananas that you eat came, came by us. So of course, just to use an example, if we look at that, that supply chain to bring the bananas to the United Kingdom, there are, and we look at the number of elements to, to make that successful, there are a couple of niche potential vendors in there, yeah. both in the UK end and, and potentially through, through us, yeah. who could disrupt that supply. And being able to sort of see your perspective on who that could be, you know, wh where do you see vendors that could disrupt that? And we can share with you where we think some of those are. That would be really powerful because, oh, well, oh no. We're all almost equal there. <laughs> yeah. Oh, no. At the end of the day, we can't go to all the vendors and make them good. But if we find the niche ones that could prevent the banana getting to the UK and share that with you, then I think that, that's, a, that's a start. How can end users contribute to a more secure cyber ecosystem? A great question. No, I think that, that oh yeah, we're, we're getting down to the we'll really, down to the really, really tough, tough ones, ones aren't we? Wait till you do the rubber band one. No, yeah. I know. I've, I've got no chance with that. I might give that a go. There's a spanner down the there. Is, so Why there's a the spanner in a body, I don't know. But there yeah. you go. So um, I think the basic principle is, is quite important. What we're seeing is great, in the old days, you know, you would send out lots of awareness training to users about, you know, if you see a phishing email, here's what to do, A, B, yeah. and C, and D. But I think users are becoming increasingly frustrated by that because their, their expectation is, why do I have to deal with a phishing email? Isn't that what you guys do? Don't, aren't you supposed to stop any of this getting to me in the first place? And that all I, all I should be aware of is the odd one that gets through. And yet, what we're trying to explain is this is, a, this is a risk issue we're facing in the user landscape. We're operating an open environment so that you can operate outside the business, yeah. talk to people, exchange information. But once we do that, we create the very, it heighten the very risk. And therefore, we're going to have the odd event that we're going to have to manage. If we, if we were to lock it down, 
that's great. We won't be dealing with events, but you wouldn't be able to yeah. operate. And so it's finding a balance between your ability to do your job externally to others and our ability to try and control the environment. And that's increasingly difficult to your very early point about the threat. Yeah. You know, with this increasing threat that we've got and the this what I call the growth of the attack surface to enable the business to flourish. Yeah. We are going to have these events and we need to educate. I think we need to educate the users to why they're seeing this yeah. and what part they can really help and make it a very positive experience for them. You know, getting users to understand that it's a balance. We're making, you know, um, very often as cyber leaders, we're, we're doing risk management and they're part of that. Oh, oh I can't good. believe it. That's, and this um, is, I think this, this is going to be really tough. We're down right? to you're, the... you're, you're going to need to draw on all of that surgical sort of skills <laughs> cheating you've got at home. Yeah, um, it's funny so, how that's uh, my operating house, yeah. you know. <laughs> Um, yeah. Because actually, you know, again, there's only so far, it can only ever be a component, you know, of, of risk management, but also it's that balance. And I think often educating users to say, well, here's the choice almost, you know, we yeah. can we can take some of that security burden off you, mm. but then that might not give you the operational Even flexibility the operation you that you want. As the use of AI is rising, you know, what are the cybersecurity implications and what should we be thinking about in this space? So maybe I'll sort of start at a sort of national level, I suppose, give you a sort of government perspective, but then move down to what I think that means for enterprises and, and consumers. Um, so have yeah, have you have idea. a go, see if you can do that. So, yeah. um, so from a government point of view, I think we think about AI, um, uh, you know, in multiple ways. I mean, obviously, oh, like any, I'm gonna add that one because it was. So, well, go on, Al. I've been God, very God. kind to you today. Oh, no, I mean, that would um, make me 5 3. Yeah, uh, don't worry, don't worry. Sure, I'm sure. sort of, yeah. I can um, put it back again. No, it's fine. It's <laughs> fine. Clearly, like any technology, there are threats and opportunities. And, right. you know, from a government point of view, we're hugely uh, positive and, and optimistic around some of the great opportunities that AI presents for. Um, for our citizens, for the countries, Absolutely. you know, it, yeah. it can transform services. Um, and so there's great, you know, a lot of reasons to be really positive about AI. Yeah. There's a lot in the media and out there about some of the risks and sort of, you know, machines taking over and whatever. Um, I think, you know, you've got to get a perspective in that. And from the our point of view, rubber band. when you look at those threats, I think they sort of fall into three camps. And the first one is absolutely, does it give our adversaries an edge? Yeah. And so what we're trying to think about is how are they, how might they um, become better and more effective. Yeah. Um, I think secondly though, what we're also really interested in is how can we use it in defence mm. uh, to defend our networks. And actually you touch on the sort of, you know, lots more spear fishing. Well, if AI's generated it, can we see if AI can detect it? And then the third part is actually is the cybersecurity of the AI itself. Now is the moment to think about how we make those systems secure, Absolutely. not discover in five or 10 or 20 years time that they're not. Massive backdoors. And so that third part, I think is really key. There is a danger in our community because we're always seen as the glass half empty, aren't we? I guess sometimes as a community, you know, what, what is our job in the modern business context? Oh no. <laughs> Sorry. Oh no. <laughs> In the modern business context, so we're getting closer. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's just could be down to the wire. Um, but in the modern business context, you know, I think we are got to be seen as enablers. We've got to be seen as working with a business to sort of absolutely optimise the benefits that they need to get from that product. I think we need our jobs to enable the business. How does the business successfully exploit the benefits of AI in a secure way? I think we're there. I might have won, won, I think you have. Hey, look, brilliant. What a great game. Thanks, great. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks, Really Andy. good. Great. Had a great so, conversation. Yeah, thank Fantastic. you. Really enjoyed that. Yeah.